Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you again this weekend. So it's like nice to get to meet because I think in the previous class we talked about, we started with PyTorch, then we moved to Tensors, then we talked about deep learning, that's just plain neural networks. Then we also spoke more about convolutional neural networks. Then in the last class, we more of spoke about custom data sets, how you could work with custom data sets and going modular. And particularly this week, we will touch a very maybe small aspect, which itself it's not really machine learning itself, but it will help you in when you try to like build models. It's uh and it helps you in when you try to build models and how you could particularly like look at how your model is training in a very good manner. So in this week we'll be looking at uh, PyTorch experiment tracking. And then towards the end, maybe about 20 minutes, then we'll talk about the capstone project. So you have like one capstone project which will encapsulate like everything we've been doing in this uh, particular deep learning class. So just to begin, uh, so we will continue with the main notebook we have been using, just to highlight a few parts. But in terms of the coding aspect of it, we won't be using this. We'll use another simpler notebook for that. So but I will tell you the reason why we'll be doing that. So. Uh, yes. Right. Yes. So we'll be doing experiment tracking. So I think it's very good to kind of point out what experiment tracking means and maybe with an example. So when you are building a model, so you want your model to predict some kind of quantity really well for you. How will you make sure it predicts that quantity really well? You monitor the loss or the accuracy or some kind of metrics it your model has. So when you measure that metrics, usually uh, by default, you will print it to the screen. That is good. But in the very long run, it won't be like of good advantage to you. Why is that? Because when you print to screen and you make another run, so it generates another different value for you. So and when it generates another different value, it's likely the case you might forget or displace the previous value. So when you kind of have this, when you carefully track this experiment, then you will know what particularly is improving your model. Is your model improving or is it maybe degrading with time? Then you will make the valuable adjustments to this model so that it will be able to uh, improve. So you could, there are several ways you could go about it. You could either, Let's say you could print on screen, which is like one of the default ways we try to do when we start machine learning, or you could save a CSV file. So when you save a CSV file, it's also good, but it's like local on your laptop. So it also has some kind of uh, disadvantages when you use CSV files in which you just have plain numbers and it's kind of difficult. You have, you have to generate maybe graphs from the CSV, which is additional extra code you need to do. Then there are other kind of methods that have been developed over the years, one of which is TensorBoard. So TensorBoard was more of uh, developed along with uh, TensorFlow. So it was a kind of like additional kind of library for uh, how you could track your experiments when using TensorFlow. But people have adapted it to other libraries like PyTorch, you could use uh, TensorBoard with in relation to PyTorch. But there are other like more recent ones that have really gained prominence and are really good. One of which is weights and biases, which is used for tracking experiments. And there's the MLflow. I personally haven't used it, but I believe it's really good too. So when this particular notebook, what they use here is TensorBoard. But for us, we won't be using TensorBoard for two reasons, one of which for me, I find weights and biases really easy. So if you are, because you have the notebook now, so you could easily run it with TensorBoard and see how it works for you, then this is will be like an additional advantage to you since it's weights and biases. So it's something different from what this notebook will be uh, teaching. So, yes. So I would say maybe for me, one of the pros with uh, weights and biases, which, we'll which you will see also, it's like it's very easy to set up. So you install the library and with a few clicks, you just get going as soon as possible. And they have like some remarkable visualization feature in which it will be very beneficial to you. And beyond that, things that I haven't experimented is 
with is if you are doing things with maybe natural language processing or LLMs, they have like a good visualization board or some kind of prompting system in which you could test your LLMs uh, on, on the go. So, but for MLflow, I haven't used it honestly. So you also see like the reporting part of weights and biases in which you would also work with. So I think for now, what we'll do is take you, you have this notebook, so you could run it, but this notebook here is more of focus on TensorBoard, but for us just to get like an additional feel of something different. So I don't know, you might um, run this and enjoy like using TensorBoard compared to maybe for me, who enjoys using weights and biases, but I just want to maybe give you the opportunity to learn maybe both, then feel free to uh, do what you want to do. So any is fine, yes. So just to start, I will take you to a very simple notebook that have been developed by the, it's just like a starter notebook for the weights and biases for tracking experiments. So what you, you will also see the dashboard. So how, with and biases work is like they have this one db library which you install and easily you just call one or two methods and it locks your experiments for you so when it locks your experiment what it does first it's it generates some local files on maybe within the directory of your projects which is one you have it locally and two it sends it to a kind of remote server which is based on your account so with that remote server, it's possible for you to share your experiments with anyone. It's also possible for you to do a lot of things. So particularly like sharing experiments, visualization, generating reports, that's for me what interests me with it. So here I will just give you a simple introduction to 1DB and that's majorly what you need to know. Any additional thing is just more of like, uh, just some additional things you add on it. But when you know these basics, you get, it's easy for you to get started 1DB. So, one of the first things you want to do is to just install the library here and just with a pip install. So you import, then you log in here. So the essence of you logging in here, oops, yes. So the essence of you logging in here, as you said, as like I said initially, it has like a remote server in which it sends your experiment to. But that most server is like kind of under your account. So you have access to that. If you want, you can make it public. If you want, you could make it private. So either with anything that works for you. So in here, you need to log in. So in the very first start, let's say you have not initialized anything or have not run any experiments. So it will either take you to the page to log in or it will act or you could provide like the API key in this particular uh in this particular kind of method and you would directly log in with the api key so any works so let's say you are logged in now like as i am now so what so what you could do is consider like an experiment setting in which you want to run an experiment so imagine in this case what you are doing is similar to how you would train a neural network but here it is just generating a bunch of random numbers. And so think of, so maybe I'll just explain segment by segment. So, you know, when you are running an experiment or training model, you maybe want to run it multiple times because we deal with a number of random numbers. Then because of those random numbers, you want to run the experiment maybe five times, then take the average. So running those experiment five times in, with some biases, you call them as runs. So for each run, that's maybe each training of your model. So you call them as runs. So what you, so here, what they are doing is just like categorizing or like defining like how many times you want your model to run. So, and what next? So the first thing, initial thing you might need to do when, uh, when setting up your 1DB is this initialization. So what you want to tell your 1DB is I want to kickstart my experiment tracking with this particular, uh, let's say this particular maybe parameters for simplicity. So what's those parameters? You have, initially you have what we call here project name. So this is, the idea of project name is just like, what's the name of your project? I'm doing deep learning for animal classification. So 
it's a name of project. So maybe all the runs I do will be under the planning, under the name deep planning for animal classification. So here we see the name here is basic introduction. So you will let us see in the visualization board how everything would add up for you. Then in this particular run, you are making an experiment. So you are telling it like, what is the name? You could also define the name of the, your run here, which is experiment. It could be experiment run one, run two, run three. So it could be any name. You could specialize a name for it if you want. But here they are just using like numbers to generate the names. And one other important thing you could do here is you could keep store of your hyperparameters in under config here. So you have this in store for you. So anytime you look at your uh the metrics, then you know what particular hyperparameters was used to generate this particular metrics, which is really, really cool. So, and if, yes, so you remember, this is like similar to where you have like your, let's say learning rate, you have your architecture here, you have your data set and you have airport. So you could, you could have several things. So one good thing I usually see, or I usually do, like your hyperparameters, you set it at the initial beginning of your notebook. So it's it could be, you could do like anything you want. But for me, I usually set my hyperparameters the very beginning of my notebooks. So I know even when rerunning the notebook, I don't like maybe take time looking for my hyperparameters. I know they are at the very beginning. So it's easy to make uh, edits to them. So when you have all your hyperparameters in maybe the very beginning, so you could easily pass it to the config here. So config, you could pass in a dictionary to it and it accepts it easily. So this config here just holds your hyperparameters that you use for the particular run. So it could be anything. Then, yes. So that's just the initialization part. So it's just the initialization part of the one DB. Then what next? So easily, you know how we try to start like the model training and when you train model, it generates some kind of metrics. So let's assume for simplicity, everything here generates a metric. And at the end, we have like two metrics, which are this accuracy and loss. Then we want to store this loss in a very neat format based on, let's say, 1db, uh, how 1db stores this data. So what would you do? So directly what you call is 1db.log. So you are telling 1db, hey, I have generated this particular matrix. Can you log it for me? So it takes in, you give it some kind of, uh, some name of what the matrix is or any value you are expecting to get, then pass in, pass it uh, the value of what that matrix is. So it understands that you have some value and you want to store it as accuracy. You have another value here and you want to store it at, as loss. So when it does that, when you log it, it saves it as a file, but you don't really bother much with the file it saves locally. So what you bother much is like what it sends to the remote server. Then you could just look at the remote server and see what is being generated. And finally, what you might need to do is 1db.finish. So you remember when, let's say you open a file, maybe file.open, then when you are done with, let's see XYZ you are doing, you will do maybe file.close, right? So, and yeah, so something like that. So what you want to do is like tell it you are finished with uh, the login of experiments. Maybe she'll do a new one, but you are done for that. So, and that's all you are done. So it's very simple. Maybe in two, three steps, you are done. First, you maybe log in. That's like very easy to do. Then you initialize your 1DB. Then you log your, your metrics. Then finish, you are done. So let me just run this, then show you how it's been visualized on the 1DB, uh, 1DB page. So here... So the code is running. So the code is running and generating some values. And here you see some bit of logs, but you don't really bother about that. So yes. So here you have some links of the experiments. It has run experiment one. 
So you could, it's telling you like you could see it at this particular link and you could view the run. This is where the project is located at, basic intro, which was the project name we set it as. And here's just maybe some micro visualization, but there is far better visualization when you see the web page there. So I think it's all done. So what you could do is, <clears throat> so this is my 1DB page and it has like a list of projects I've been running. So like I told you, like I enjoy using 1DB, it's really good. So I maybe hopefully I'm advertising for them. Maybe you could enjoy it too. So you could see it has generated like we have this new project, which was a project name we set it as. And you could see it had five runs. So which was like the number of times we ran the experiments. You remember here, we set the run, total runs as five. So maybe let's say you are training a model up to like 10 times, then you have maybe 10 or depending on the number of runs you have. So then easily you could click on the project. You could see all... So on this particular side, you see all the runs you have. Then in this other area of the notebook here, you see some kind of visualization of what uh, of the metrics you have. And easily, you could see it has a kind of very rich visualization. So you don't need to bother much. Like, let's say, assuming you were doing it initially locally on your laptop, and you print some values or generate some figures. So it's kind of difficult. You look at this figure or you save this figure and trying to compare them side to side. It's usually very difficult. But with this, you have a very neat visualization and you could see at every step of your training, you could see what is improving or what is not doing so well. And at the very end, what's the best model for you? So you could easily see that. And it has like lots of features. So this is just a few that I just wanted to show you. And this is a random code. So I will show you one of the code that has to do with deep learning. And just so that you will see it in action, but we won't run it just so that you see it. Then I will come back to maybe, yes. So I'll come back to the project here and show you how it works. So this is one of the moments. So let's see. So let's look at this particular code that has to do like image classification with Cypher and ResNet. So just to, so here, what you could see here, initially, like I said, you import your 1DB. Then, like I said, as much as possible, it's just maybe some advice. Set your hyperparameter initialization at the very, first stage so it's easier for you to know what kind of experiment you are running than maybe spreading it out across your notebook so it's difficult to track what you are uh, what type of parameters you are doing then you could see here i'm um, initializing the project here with the project name with the project name and maybe passing in some configurations and the run name so depending on how you want to set up your project. Then the more interesting part is where I log the, the metrics I do have. Yes. yes, so so this is where I do my login for the experiments. So here you could see I have, I have my train accuracy, I have loss and train and test loss. Then I pass in a dictionary into your 1DB uh, log method. So, and it sends that to a remote server and you could easily visualize that. So I'll just show you the visualization so that you could have a feel of how it works. So the interesting thing about like dot .log is accepts almost, it accepts like a large amount of uh, data objects. You could log images, you could log maybe you could log, uh, let's say you are working with LLMs and you might log, you might want to log maybe the response of the LLM just so that you could use it for further training or for uh, or for carefully kind of making sure like everything is in order. So you could do a lot of that. And let me just show you some of the visualization for this particular project. And yes, so let me just...
So here I have run a lot of different experiments. You could see one with VGG, Google Net, and ResNet. So and you could see here is more of like the visualization of what I have run. So you could see it has like some very neat depiction of what's happening in the background. It's similar to like plotting, but here it's very rich. So depending on what you do, then I think one other thing I logged in the other notebook is the confusion matrix. So at every run of the model, I have like a confusion matrix. So it's easy for me, apart from just knowing the accuracy, I also have like some images of the confusion matrix. So at every point in time, when I'm not confident of the result, I could always look at the confusion matrix, which is really good. So you could log anything. Let's say you're doing RL and the RL you are looking at pixels of like the agent environment. So you could also log that. So it's also be helpful in your training. So just to, so one other thing you could do, they have what they call reports. It's very nice for generating really neat reports. You know how you have, let's say Markdown. Maybe I would say it's, yes, let's say you know how you have Markdown, but it makes it really easier when you have logged your metrics, then it could maybe close to automatically generate reports for you. And you could convert those reports to PDF, or in very nice LaTeX format, which you could easily use for maybe any presentations or maybe submissions, paper submissions. So let me just show you an example of one of the reports I, I have generated. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, yes. So let's say I have done some experiments and I have logged them using 1DB. So you could easily see, this is like a reinforcement learning experiments I ran. And like these are some of the results. So I could share these re reports with you and you could easily look at them and also interact with them. And I could easily convert this to PDF or to LaTeX and you could like modify from LaTeX from there. So that's how cool this thing is. But this is like one of the very few things you could do with uh, with some biases, like there are lot of, lots of other important things you could enjoy using them for. So those are the major things. And like I said, like this part is really short and direct just to help you like streamline how you would run your experiments like more efficiently. So that's one thing. So I think that's majorly it for this part and happy to answer maybe any <laughs> questions that if you have, feel free to drop on the chats. So just one maybe question I want to ask. So what, so here we are talking about experiment tracking. What things do you think when running your machine learning system you might need to track or it's important to track? So you could just maybe, if you want, you could unmute your mic or you could, uh, you could see it in the chat. So what important components do you think we could, uh, we could track in your machine learning model? I think the accuracy and the loss. Yes, yes, nice, nice. So accuracy and loss are really cool things you could uh you could track very good. And there's also another comment by Lukman. Thank you, Abaka Dasan. Also loss and accuracy. Wait. Yes, wait. That's also an important part because when so I think one way you could look at it, I would say maybe anything. Okay, yes, there's a comment by Sani Aji. The time it takes, it's also really good. Yes, so let's say you are doing an RL problem or a machine learning problem. The time it takes is really important. So maybe in general, I'll say, if you know anything changes in your machine learning pipeline, so it's really good to log it. So you know, like your models parameters changes, like someone said, like the weights. So the learning rates, yeah, anything hyperparameters. Thank you, Munzali. So you would need to track it really well. So anything you know that changes in your model, so it would be really nice to track it because you could always like come back to it and see. And I think I particularly like the one weights because weights are very important. So because when you are, let's say, training a neural network and you don't monitor the weights, you only monitor the accuracy. So you there are like underlying things that happen within your model itself that if you don't monitor them, so it becomes a really big, 
issue to some extent, one of which is like where your weights tend to be zero and they are not really having any values. So when you track uh, your weights, so it will be easy for you to look at them. And one cold thing with one dB, it's automatically, I think if you're using PyTorch also, let me see if we could see something. So it automatically tracks your weights. You could see, so yes, so it tracks your, let's see, and let's say another cool thing you could track is like your machine performance. So if you are doing very intensive stuff on CPU or GPU, you could see like how intensive it is, like how much of your CPU or GPU it is consuming. So when you, there's this system section here. Yeah. So anything that has to do with your maybe laptop or uh, device performance. So you could see here, it's telling me that Google Linux consumes more GPU than, let's see here that is, which is this, than maybe some other kind of model. So here you could also track GPU performance. If that's what interests you, then I'm not sure. I just want to see, but there is some particular part that tracks how like your that tracks uh, your model like the weight so you could set it up in your let me just see which is it so you could set it up in your notebook you turn it on for it to track you, the weight of your uh, deep learning model so and you could kind of see how your models are i think not this So, but it's really cool, like when you start to work with it, so you will really, you will really enjoy it. And there are lots of cool things you could do with it. So if you haven't used it before, I will be, to be nice to try it out and see for yourself. So hopefully, so I think there is a comment that if we could, there's a comment that if we could briefly recap, yes. So. I think with this class, what we said is, let's say initially when you try to train your models, so what you do initially is just to print on screen or you save in a file, that's the output of your model, what your model is predicting. But in the very long run, it's not the best way to go about it because like one thing is it could, you could lose that easily. And let's say when you write it, you could be confused and overwhelmed with lots of numbers. Like I said in the previous class, visualization is really key. But like using these tools are a better way of tracking your metrics. Just keeping sure like every experiment you run, it might look a bit, maybe the results are a bit silly in one run, but when you dig deep, you will see that the results are actually interesting. But if you don't track your metrics or maybe anything that relates to your training, so you could easily lose it. But having this experiment tracking within your machine learning pipeline is really key and helpful most times. So one or so there are several tools you could use for tracking your experiments. There is TensorBot, which was developed closely with uh, TensorFlow, but has been adapted to be used to and could be used for PyTorch and other libraries. And there is like other like common ones now, like weights and biases, which I just gave like a small visualization of how you could use it. So like weights and biases, what it does is after you install it like a library, then you call one or two methods of it, then it locks your experiment. So it saves it as a file, but more importantly, I think it's, you could also turn it on or off, like sending it to a remote server. So when it sends it to a remote server, you could share it with anyone like your friend or anything. So imagine you, let's see, maybe I don't know you and you told me you achieve 100% accuracy. So I might begin to have doubts, but when you share me your experiments, or the results of your experiment, so I begin to believe. So I think that's like the major highlight of this particular section. So I believe maybe, maybe if you miss part of the code we explained, it's fairly direct. So I think one of the first things you do here, you log in to the 1DB and it takes you to a page or you provide your API key. So what you do, you initialize here. That's the very first thing you just kind of, given some names, that's your project name or and values of 
let's see the hyperparameters you want to track or the configurations of your current model, which is good. Then maybe close to final, you log the values. So you are telling it like, these are the values that are important to me, save it for me. So, and finally you are done. So that's like the major thing. So everything else, so after you're done with this, you find everything else within like a very nice visualization here, which is really good and cool. So, so I think that's majorly it. Is it possible to fake experiments? I think it's, yes, I think it's, I'm not sure, but I think it's very possible to fake experiments because, but I don't know how people do it, but I think what usually happens, people try to like rerun your code all over, even though you have like this experiment done. Maybe if you tell me the hyperparameters you use, then I try to run it on maybe a similar machine. But if it doesn't give me good results, then I know maybe there might be some loopholes or something of that nature. So it's very possible, 100% to take experiments, yeah. So, and uh, yeah. so please feel free if you have any questions. So, so I think there is another comment by Lukman, the model two. Okay, yes, uh, Lukman talked about like model two. You could, uh, you could track models. Yes, so like the pickle file generated by the models. So you could maybe you could log them too. So I, in one DB they have what they call artifacts, so you could log act artifacts. So some things like model, like the pickle file of your model, so you could also log them, yes. So but I think that's majorly it for logging. It's a bit simple in its own way. And maybe when you look at the notebooks, so you, you will grab it really much. And yes, so I think the, We'll just go very much quickly towards the final part. So, like I said, there will currently we have done like some assignment previously, which was really good. So I think okay, let me just answer the question by Sani. Please, can you clarify these multiple runs? So multiple runs is let's say you have a model, right? Let's say you are training very simple uh neural network. So you could train it once and you get a result, but let's say you would want to train it again because like your weights are random. So you want to try like multiple trainings just to make sure your, your predictions are accurate. Let's say I train it like I train one model five times. So those particular five times I train my model. So those are five runs. So each run is like, yes, I did something with my model. So that's one run. I train my model the first time, that's run one. The second time, run two. The third time, run three. The, yeah, four or five times continuously. So those can be different runs. So within those runs, your hyperparameters can be the same. If you want, you could maybe change one or two hyperparameters. Yeah, so it just depends on how you set your experiments. So those are like multiple runs, so. Yeah. Sorry, sir, can I add something? Yes. So I'm just curious that if you are, like running it for the second time yes maybe the data set is already like the model has already so the image data set so mm. how can we solve that kind okay. of okay so like when i mean like the second time so let's say consider like training a model once like you train it across you define like 100 epoch and it goes through all the 100 epoch so that's like you train the model once then like the second one will be like a different a new model that has not learned anything completely and uh, like a fresh model and let's say it looking at the data like at the very new instance so that's like the second time the third time too like a fresh model all over again so that's like like one full training let's see okay let's see consider let's see multiple runs let's say consider you are training an RL agent and the agent you are putting it in an environment. So when you train the first time, maybe it learns to navigate like some obstacle environments. So like that's one run. Then you create like a new instance of a new agent that has no memory at all. Then you give it maybe the same environment. So that's like the second run. So the third run, similarly, like a new agent, like the brain is maybe blank navigating the environment. So that's like the third run. So something fresh, yes. But maybe it's using like the same uh, maybe they have the same structure. 
So like in neural network, you would just say maybe a model has not learned anything. So you have assigned random weights to it. So, and you want to kind of see like from the random weights, will it make some maybe predictions or will it differ from the previous model predictions? Hmm. So, okay, no, I say. And so there is another question from Munzali. Can I use custom data set? Yes, I think you are free. So the more, the most important essence of this is more of like, you could track anything. So when anything your model generates or anything within your machine learning pipeline, you could track them. So it doesn't matter the inputs. If you want, you could also track like the data sets, maybe in a case where maybe your data is maybe dynamic, let's say RL, for instance, let's say the first, the first like states of your environment, it changes after your agent makes another new action. So you could maybe log those states so that like later on after your agent is done training, then you could like look at it like an evaluator from an outside lens to see uh, how your agent has performed rather than just seeing the entire reward itself. So that's one way you could go about it. Mm. So yes, that's nice questions. Thank you. So I think just to highlight on the capstone project. So like we said, Initially, I said there will be two capstone projects, but please disregard that because of time. I believe it would be maybe time consuming. So the earlier we, not really the earlier. So with this, like it has everything you need for, even though we will do it as separate projects. So with this capstone project, it will be in groups. So I know there are like nine, officially I think there should be 19 fellows, but maybe, maybe 19 to 20. So we'll have like four groups. So each of the four groups will have maybe four to five, minimum of five people. And there is like some inactivity in like the submission of the assignments. So I will also take that into consideration, but don't worry. I think with your teammates, you'll be able to put in a good work. And yes, so like the essence of this is you've learned like, you've learned to, you've learned to work with image data sets. So let's see like what you've learned, how can we transfer to like some kind of new image data sets? So preferably if it could be a local data set of maybe Nigeria or African origin, but I wouldn't want you to do anything super complex because I know like these things can be a bit time consuming. So, and especially like with the limitations of compute, so which is one. So maybe just take any data sets that you want are comfortable with, but it shouldn't be something we've done in the past, like the fashion MNIST or MNIST. So something slightly more advanced, but not so advanced. If you could do the advanced one, feel free. So maybe it could be local or anything of that nature. Then you'll be using a pre-trained model. So you won't struggle much with it. So because we have done pre-training and you have worked with it. So maybe use at least two pre-trained models. So you could you choose any two of the two pre-trained models you want to use, anyone, you you are left with the decision. Then maybe one thing we want to see is like you deploying the model. So the model deployment, even though we'll do it like in the next two or three sessions, so you still have enough time. There's enough deadline before the end of the assignment. So you shouldn't bother much about this. So I think one thing maybe I'll mention about the grouping, you are four in number and, okay, maybe I will come to that yet. So, so I think the more the deliverables for the assignment is maybe your code on GitHub, then some a two page, a double column paper. So it's just two page paper. So your references will be inclusive in the two page paper because it's like I don't make it super complex, and so, and I also would love to see like some maybe maybe a link to the one DB or TensorBot just to make sure like you have made the trainings as much as possible. So, so that maybe someone didn't fake data. So, and there'll be like just a very short presentation video. So the essence of presentation video is just to maybe a small outline of what you've done, maybe what model you use, maybe talked about briefly about the challenges, then just show me it works with maybe some real data that is outside your data sets. So you have deployed the model. So I believe you have some kind of, uh, maybe some simple web page in which you could 
use like uh, an image, plug in an image and you influence it with your model. So there are lots of really cool libraries you could easily use for this visualization. I don't need to relearn HTML or CSS from scratch. I think like there is Gradio and even maybe Hogan Face has some visualization capability for a model. You could easily use that. So you have some kind of really wide timeline about four weeks. So maybe, yeah, about four weeks. So one thing with the timeline or working groups is it's, it's like two ways. It can have advantage or disadvantage. If you work, if you collaborate well, this one month will be maybe about four months. But if you don't collaborate well, it can get a little bit tricky. One month can be one week. So please uh, maybe uh, try to collaborate well. So for me, you would get like additional support anytime in the weekends. So I'll be happy to support and when is this? So we could always organize calls. I could maybe look at your code, anything you want, just let me know. I would be happy to help with that. So I think in the meantime, I will, there is some more detailed PDF about this assignments. So that will like contain this information and maybe give you one or two pointers about it. So, but yeah, so I think within this time frame, it shouldn't be a problem, but in case it becomes a problem, just let me know, inshallah. Mm. So this is like the major part of it. So more of like something end to end. So, and it just covers like the previous assignments and the subsequent assignments. So it just to give you like freedom to do some things and interact. So rather than, because with the assignments, like you know what to expect, but here you are doing something in the real world. So there is a question, is it only classification or can we do something image segmentation? Yes, I think for now, maybe the focus will be classification. But if you are able to do classification, please feel free to do something beyond that. So yes, because there's enough time. But if you are able to do classification, I think first, if you could get done with classification and if, yes, you could definitely go for segmentation, but please maybe uh, let's start with classification, then you could go beyond that, inshallah, yes. But feel free to do as much as possible. So this is just like the maybe just like bare, bare, bare minimum. So, but please feel free to do beyond that, inshallah. So, but if there's anything that is confusing about this or anything not clear, or you feel like anything is too much, just let me know, inshallah. And also ask question with, uh, I'm very, yes. Just let me know, inshallah. So I think uh, apart from this, it will be like the major, Apart from this, so yeah, so I'm happy to answer any questions. So if you have any questions, please just let me know. Mm -hmm. It could be like this, today's session, the assignment or any of the previous classes. So like with the PDF I will send, it will have like your team members. So inshallah, you have all the information there and you could try setting up things. So as much as possible, just try to collaborate best in any way you could do. So if you all want to work on, maybe you subdivide the tax within yourself, just maybe just try to get involved with one another. Then there will be, I would also make like the, is it something like the evaluation criteria? So which is based on like your GitHub and the rest. And like similar to like the peer review we did for week three, there'll be something similar, but much more simpler, not taxing in which you will evaluate within your groups how you were able to work together. Mm. But you shouldn't bother, it wouldn't be much of a problem, inshallah. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Um, my question is that uh, mm. uh, about uh, individual project assignment that we are going to do, that means uh, we are now focusing only on this uh, you know, group assignment? Yes, yes, you are focusing on this, but the individual ones, but please look at them because they will help you to do this because like everything about this project relates to like the learning material itself. So because the individual, at least you've gotten like some freedom working alone and getting some solutions. So here is just more of like how you would collaborate with other people because most times you will be working with other people. So it's at least a good way to look at how you would work with other people, share ideas and discuss new things and try and you would realize like in some of the notebooks that were submitted, maybe there were one or two mistakes, but when you have a number of people, 
and uh, you would like someone will be able to point out like the mistakes yes so but like the other submissions there is no uh if you submit i would like gladly look at them and review but there's no like strict requirement uh, there's no strict requirements so there is okay thank question. you so much sir yeah i have a no problem inshallah yeah so i think there's a question about last week recording thank you Lukman. yes it's uploaded today like some hours ago yes so I have a question. Yes, please. I don't know when the individual projects were given. So are they in the GitHub or somewhere? No, sorry, they are not given yet. Sorry. I think initially I made mistake. I created like two branches, like project one and project two. But I saw like to be very consuming. Then I just combined everything together to be a group project. So there is no individual submission for projects now. So what you have is like the group projects now, which uh, you will do it within your group. So that's the only like capstone project you'll be submitting, inshallah. So maybe yeah. I will just take the assignment as your uh, as your individual maybe projects. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So I will just try to round up with the PDF and send it to you maybe this night, highest tomorrow morning. So, but if there's anything, just feel free, message me. If you have any challenges, if it's your code or maybe something you're having challenges with, then maybe we'll look at it together, inshallah. So I think if there's any questions, happy to answer it before we uh, close, inshallah. But we'll still be meeting for all the next sessions. That's the next one is, the next one is, what's the name? something to do with the implementation of research. So hopefully I want to speak to someone if they're available to give the talk uh, next week, then maybe we'll continue. But all the other sessions, we'll still be having them while you continue with the assessments, inshallah. So I'll just wait one minute if there are any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so i think we'll just call it a day uh really nice speaking to you have a wonderful week ahead inshallah yeah. thank you so much thank you